This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com Okay, welcome back everyone. <clears throat> uh, Rabbi Tavak gave a wonderful shir about the Mishnah on Pirkei Avais, Yehuda ben Tema Oimer. Once we're mentioning Yehuda, we should give a Yashukayach to Yehuda for a uh, delicious machalam. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Yehuda ben Tema Oimer, Havi Az Kanomer, be bold like a leopard. The Kal Kanesh should be like like an eagle. We heard a shear about a leper today. We saw an eagle, Ratz Katzvi, run like a deer, Vagibar Kari, be mighty like a lion, Lasus Hutsana Vicha Shabashamayim. And this is not just a Mishnah in Perkei Avais. Apparently, it's a very uh, fundamental Mishnah. If, uh, as Rav Tabak mentioned, the first halach in the Torah, Rachayim, is basically this Mishnah of Yehudim and Tema Oimer. And we all know the Shachnarch begins, at least with one of them, Yiskaber Kari. Just as an aside, uh, interesting thing. How does Shulchan Aruch begin? The Shulchan Aruch starts, Yisgaber ka'ari lamoid ba'aboy ke'laboid es'boy roi. Strengthen yourself like a lion to get up for the service of Hashem. Then the Ramah says, Haga. Right, we know whenever the Ramah talks, he introduces his words with the word Haga. Footnote. And he says, okay, if you're not going to get up that early, at least don't miss the Zman Tefillah. And then he says again, Haga, shivisi Hashem lenegdi samid. It's the first Ramah. It's a Pella. What in the world is Ramah doing? It's the same comment of the Ramah. Why does he interrupt by saying Haga two times? Usually, it's the only time in the entire Shulchan Aruch where the Ramah is speaking. And in the middle of a sentence he says, footnote again. He always introduces his words with the word footnote. So why does he stick in the word footnote you know, in the middle? So Rav Pinchas Friedman told me there's a Sefer, um, Oyal Shame. It says that it's the darch, it's the style of writers to begin their words with the Yud Kei Vav Kei. You know, like Masil Sisharim starts, um, Yisoyed HaChasidus V'Sharish Avoida. You begin your work with four words that spell out Rosh Yitevah's Yud Kei Vav Kei. The Ramo is following this paradigm. Haga is numerical value 13. A second Haga makes it 26. So Rama intentionally wrote Haga two times to, you know, fulfill beginning his work with the, you know, the Yud Kei Vav Kei. Okay, be it as it may. I don't know about you, but I guess when my mind kicked in, is it seriously strengthen yourself like a lion? Does that does that resonate with you? Imagine you have a guy, he's lazy. So you say, "Come on, you scabber kari, strengthen yourself like a lion." Well, what in the world does a lion got to do with me? I'm not a lion. If you haven't noticed, I'm a human being, and I'm not built like a lion. I don't have the strength of a lion. I'm a weakling. I, you know. I can't even. I can't beat anyone in an arm wrestle, and you're telling me to be strong like a lion. I'm not a lion. That that that's a resonant. That's the message that that resonates. Imagine you have a guy lying in bed. It's ten o'clock. He says, we tell the guy get out of get out of bed for chakras. You see the supersonic jet flying overhead. Jump out of bed like a supersonic jet. I mean, I don't have any. Uh, I don't have an engine. I'm not. Uh, I'm not programmed that way. Well, that's a. Re- Imagine you had a teenager who's acting like a lazy bum, and you say, you know, run like a deer. Yeah, that, that's going to resonate with them. Be like a deer. Be like a deer. Fly like an eagle. I'm not an eagle, if you haven't noticed. I don't have wings yet. I, at least I don't show them from under my jacket. What 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 do Chazal mean? What are Chazal t- teaching us? And this is not just an idea, not just a message, but it's a fundamental message. This is the, the way Shulchan Aruch begins. Yiskaber kari lasus v'tzayin. Here's a better one. This is a really good one. So in Parshas Nitzavim, so the Torah says, "Ha'idoisi b'chem hayoyim es hashamayim ve'es ha'aretz." I call witness to you today, the heaven and earth. So what does that mean? I call witness to you today, the heaven and the earth. So Rashi says, "Look, I need witnesses to this deal we're about to make. To have a witness, I have to make sure he's going to be there. You know, when I need to summon him. So I'm going to summon heaven and earth to bear witness for me, because I know when I need to summon them and I need to call upon them, heaven and earth will be there." But then Rashi says another pshat. It's uh, inexplicable. Rashi says, "Hakadosh Baruch Hu tells Klal Yisrael, I don't understand you guys. You're so inconsistent. But look at the heaven and the earth. Did the sun ever say in the morning? Did the sun ever say, you know what? Today it's a tough day. I've already worked ten days in a row. I'm just going to take the day off. I know I'm not really. Uh, I don't have the day off." But I'm, I'm going to call it a day off, or I'm going to get up an hour later today, or two hours later today. Or instead of coming ten minutes early, I'll just come in right before Baruch Hu. The sun never did that. It's amazing. The sun never came a moment. Yeah, Mayor? The sun never came 
a moment late. Or let's say Rashi says, the Eretz, did anybody ever plant um, wheat and barley grew? Did anybody ever plant a tomato and a potato grew? No, it never happened, right? Whatever people plant, that's exactly what grows. So says Rebunisham, I don't understand you. Why are you guys, you Jews, why are you so inconsistent? You're lazy, you're not consistent, you come late, and I don't even reward the sun and the moon. And you guys, I'm going to reward. Follow the example of the sun and the moon. I'm saying, like, that resonate. That, that, that's a meaningful thing to you? Imagine, you have a guy, and, you know, Shachos is 6.30, you're like dead tired, the night before you were watching lions in the middle of the night, right? And we tell the guy, get up already! The sun got up, so why don't you get up? That's a meaningful message. The sun got, the sun got up, the sun is programmed to get up. The sun has no option, but that's like telling somebody like this, I don't understand you. Why aren't you doing what you need to do? Your watch is ticking, your watch is going around, so you should also do what you, you got to do. You need to learn every single day, just like the sun shines every single day. I mean, give me a break, you got to be kidding me. That's a meaningful message. The sun is programmed that way. The sun has no free choice, but I have free choice. And I really do not want to do what I need to do today. I'm too tired, I'm not feeling it, I don't feel connected. Every day I have to dive in. Every day, you know, tonight, I'll just take a day off. No, the sun never takes a day off. That's because the sun doesn't have days off. But I actually could choose to stay in bed. So I would like to do that today. What exactly is Rebunisham? This is God. God understands how we work, right? As great as uh, any psychologist is, God knows our psyche. He created it. And He's giving us what should be a meaningful message. He's saying, do what you got to do daily, consistently, because the sun and the moon do what they need to do every day. I mean... Seem, if you think about it, doesn't seem to be uh, that compelling of a message. In Mishlei, Shlomo Melech says, he's talking to a lazy guy, and he says, hey, lazy guy, go to the nimala, go to the ant. see the ways of the ant, vachacham, and become wise. Now the ant, Shlomo Melech says, doesn't have like a ruler, a dictator, standing over them, hitting them, saying, work, work, work. And yet, yet, Shlomo says, Tochin bakayitz lachma, she prepares in the summer her bread. That means in the season that the ant is able to work, she gathers, she prepares, she works, she works. Agra vakotzer machala, she piles up, she collects in the harvest her food. And you bum, ad masai otzel tishgav, how long are you going to stay in bed? Masai taka mishnah when you get out of bed. Look at the ant. The ant doesn't sleep. So you shouldn't sleep. Understand? You think the ant chose to get up in the morning? You think the ant was lying there? And all of a sudden the ant alarm clock went off. And the ant then, should I press no? Should I not press no? No! I'm going to wake up. I'm going to jump out of bed. Of course not. The ant is programmed. It's, it's an instinct. No, but there's no such thing as a lazy ant. There never was a, a lazy ant. There never will be a lazy ant. So how could you tell a human being... Look at the ant. Don't be lazy. Is that really a very compelling message? And then the Medrash, the Medrash in Dvarim Rabbah, says a few uh, interesting scientific facts about the Namala. First of all, the Medrash says the Namala has a three-floored house. In the house of an ant, there are three floors. Uh, it does not go on the top floor because it leaks in. It doesn't go on the bottom floor because it's dirty. It stays in the middle floor. Says the Medrash, no ant ever lived more than six months. Why? Because any creature that does not have vertebrae and does not have sinews and does not have the structure to survive cannot survive more than six months. And how much food does it need? One grain of, wo- of wheat and a half. For the entire uh, lifespan of an ant, all it's going to eat is... Uh, You know, here, this piece of rice and half of another piece. This is all that it needs for its entire existence, right? That would be like saying, how much money does a human being need for its existence? I don't know, you know, multiply your salary by 80, 90 years. So this is all an ant needs for six months. Says the Medrash, how much does it collect? It collects and collects and collects and collects. In fact, the Medrash said they once went into an ant's home and they found 300 kair. 
That means they found basically, you know, a table up to the ceiling full of these uh, kernels. And the only thing it needs is this for its entire existence. Why does the ant work so much? Says the Medrash, the ant makes the following calculation. Shema yigzar alai HaKadosh Baruch Chayim. Maybe I'll live longer. Hey, you never know. You know in America? You never heard that? You play the lottery. Why? What's the slogan for lotto? Hey, you never know. Even though you do know, you know you're not going to win. It's statistically impossible to win the lottery. But there are millions and billions of people who are stupid enough to buy the lottery ticket because why? Hey, you never know. So that's what the ant says. The ant says, I might live longer than six months. So you can ask, okay, let's, and let's make a calculation. If your life expectancy is six months, how much longer do you think you're going to live? A month? So I have a great idea. Why don't you gather like another half a kernel? Why in the world are you gathering grain up to the head? How long do you think you're going to live? Are you going to live a billion years? And I have another thing. Even if the ant would live a billion years, it will have another harvest next year. So if it lives again, it will collect next year. Why in one year does the ant just keep on collecting, keep on collecting, keep on collecting? These are all the questions of um, the Mashkiach of Ner Yisrael. His name was... Uh, he wrote a sefer, Leket Chachma Umoser. His name was Rav David Kronglas. It's actually the Rav of the show where I grew up was a son-in-law of Rav David Kronglas. And he asked all these questions. How is it a meaningful message to tell somebody, strengthen yourself like a lion, be light like an eagle, be bold like a leopard? What, how does it resonate with people to tell them, don't be lazy like an ant? How does it resonate with people, oh, you need to be consistent like heaven and earth? None of these arguments, none of these examples seem to really be meaningful. I mean, they don't seem to be meaningful to me. I don't know about you. You know, if we have a personal struggle in an area and you say, be like this creature who's programmed not to struggle. Ma- imagine you tell a student who got a 50 on the test, hey, why don't you be like Albert Einstein who got a 100 on the test? Right? He'll kick you in the face. Right? That, I'm not Einstein. I'm not even half as smart as him. So... What, what, what do Chazal mean? What are they trying to teach us? The key to understanding this is a Zoyar. This is a fantastic Zoyar. A, a wild Zoyar. On the Pasuk um, in Bereshis, where when Hashem created uh, all the matter of creation. So Hashem, on the second day of creation, He made the firmament, right? So He said, Let there be firmament. And on the third day, God said, Um... Let the water gather to one place. What else did God say on the third day? Right? God said, And He said, And on the fourth day, And on the fifth day, And on the sixth day, Let us make man. What's going on over here? Who's the us? On the second day, on the first day, it's only God made the light, only God made the firmament, only God gathered the water, only God made the luminaries, and all of a sudden on the sixth day, God is calling, what, what's going on? Another God? There's another God? Rashi says this is a dangerous pasuk. Mikan yesh makayim. Here, a place has been given for a person to make an error and to think there's more than one, uh, one God. Because who's Nasa Adam? Let us make man. Who's the us? So Rashi says, don't worry, hold your horses. The meaning here is, God was just consulting with the heavenly angels. And God was asking them, do you think uh, we should make man? Because uh, from here, we, Rashi says, we learn, that a superior should always ask the advice of their inferior. Right? So, so why? Now, you don't have to listen to them. So in other words, you're, right, all the guys who came here, they went to their wives and they said, Okay, you know, can I go on the safari? She said no, but you went anyway, but at least you had the Derech Eretz to ask permission, right? That's the, a lesson in Derech Eretz that you learn. That you should always ask permission, you should always ask the advice of those who are, are below you. Be it as it may, Rashi says, but don't worry, don't, don't think that everyone, anyone's going to make a mistake, because the end of the Pasuk says, Vayivra Elikim, and God created man. So, you know, the Briska Rav would say, if you have two yeshivas to send the kid to, one, they have more learning. And the other one, they teach better midas. So the Briska Rav would say, you should send to the yeshiva where they teach better midas. Why? It's a riot from this Rashi, he said. 
Because here, the Rebbe Hashem had to make a calculation. Should I teach clearer Torah and just say, Vayom Elikim, E'ese Adam, I will make man? Or, or let's say, Nasa Adam and teach Derech Eretz. And God decided that it's more worthwhile to teach Midas and Derech Eretz than to teach a clearer Shir. I mean, one yeshiva, they have better Shirim. And the other yeshiva, they train the boys to be Balei Derech Eretz. You see from Rashi that the character is even more important than the clarity in the learning. That's what the, the Beis HaLevi said. But that's not what I'm discussing today. The Zayar has a different take on this Pasuk. The Zayar is quoted by the Nefesh HaChayim. Let's start with Avos Reb Nassim. If you have on your sheets number 19, the Avos Reb Nassim says something somewhat startling. And he says that everything that exists in this world exists in man. The Avos Reb Nassim says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in the middle of the piece, about a third of the way through, God in it, he should be blessed forever. Baras kol oilam kuloi, baras hashamayim v'yesa aratz, v'yatsar ba'adam kol mashabar ba'ilam. God created in man everything that exists in this world. God made forests. There's a forest in man. What's the forest in man? Your hair. Your hair is a forest. Especially if you don't take a shower too often, all kinds of things start growing in there, right? But the, the hair is a forest. Says the Gemara, God created wild animals. They're wild animals in man. What are they? Your intestines. They're wild. The juices that they produce, they, they, you know, they're killers. You know, sometimes they could burn a hole right through your stomach. You know, sometimes they, they shoot up into the esophagus, you know, you know. Says the Gemara, there are many things God created. God created odor in this world. He created the nose. God created smelly water in this world. That's the mucus. God created salt water in this world. It's the tears. God created doors in this world. Your teeth. God created sweet water in this world. The saliva. And the the Medrash goes on to say that whatever exists in this world exists in a person. Okay. So whatever you could imagine then Every possible tree, every celestial body, every chemical exists in man. So says Rav Chaim in the name of the Zayra Kadosh. Now we understand why man is the finality, the grand finale of creation. God, so to speak, on the first day He created light. On the second day He made a firmament. On the third day He made vegetation. On the fourth day He made a sun. On the fifth day He made the birds and the fish. On the fifth day, on the sixth day He made animals. And then God called everyone together. He said, moon, sun, fish, birds, stars, tigers, lion, bear, gorilla. Get over here. We have a meeting now. What do you want now, God? Look, I have, uh, I have one last thing that I didn't create. The problem is I have nothing left. There's no more material. There's no more raw material left. So, the, so they say, you know, the gorilla says, what do you want from my life? So God says, everyone's going to make a, give a little nicer. Everyone's going to make a small donation. Everyone's going to take their personality, their character, and their ability, put it in the pot, put it in the middle of the table. So everyone said, okay. Every, every article, every item of creation, then donated its character and personality. They put it in the big melting pot. God took the big spoon. He mixed it together. And that's us. Man is literally a microcosm of the entire universe. In man is the power of the entirety of creation. Whatever was created on day one, whatever was created on day three, whatever was created on day six, exists within man. Man has within him the power of the sun, the water, every bird, every fish, every wild animal, every domesticated animal. Every force in creation has been condensed within the Adam. Man is called an Olam Katan. Hence, Nase Adam. When God said Nase Adam, He's not talking to Chas Vajam, another God. When God said Nase Adam, you know who He's talking to? He's talking to the sun, and He's talking to a baboon, and He's talking to a, a killer whale, and He's calling, talking to a snake, and He's talking to a mule. And He said, Rabbi Sai, let's create man. And every single item of creation came together and donated to man their strength and personality. That's what it means, Nasa Adam. So it comes out then that man is by far the most dangerous of all of creation. 
because as dangerous as, uh, you know the story of the lions of Tzavo? You ever hear that story? Oh, God, this great story. You know, this Colonel uh, John Patterson was working for the British in the beginning of the 20th century. They're building like railroad tracks in somewhere in Africa. And uh, he has a b- bunch of workers who are not white. And every night, you know, late at night, they would hear the roar of a lion. And within 10 minutes, one of them was gone. They were a man-eating lions that literally consumed one of the people every day. They could have been in their huts. They could have been up in the tree. These lions were tremendous, agile. They were killers. They heard the roar of the lion, and they were dead. Someone that night was dead, and they could not stop it. The lions ate something close to 100 people. And as dangerous as uh, finally uh, Patterson got the lions, and now they're displayed in a museum in Chicago. Everything ends up in Chicago. So, so um, as, as vicious and as dangerous as a lion is, not as dangerous as a human being could be. You know why? Because a lion is only a lion. But it's not also a tiger, and it's not also a killer whale, and it's not also a shark, and it's not also a snake, and it's not also an asp, and it's not also a cobra, and it's not also a boa constrictor, but a human being, there is nothing more dangerous than a human being. Look at Hitler. No lion ever did what Hitler did. No lion ever did. Could, could you imagine a lion with human seichel? Can you imagine a lion with the ability to plan and the ability to use technology? So, so the destruction it, it would be incredible. Man is by far the most dangerous of all the creation. That's why. Avraham Avinu says, Avraham Avinu comes to uh, Avimelech, and he says, you know, you live in a wonderful city. You know, you have culture here, and you have technology here. What words did Avraham Avinu say? Rak ein yiras alekim b'makam azad. The only thing you're missing is fear of God. Now listen carefully. What's the last pasuk in Koheles? Saif davar akal nishma es alekim yira v'es mitzvah sa av shema erki kal hadam. Here, the, the last passing in Ecclesiastes. Soif Davar. Here's the summation. Here's the executive summary. Esalekim Yura, fear God. Why? Kizak Kol Adam. That's the entirety of man. The entirety of man is fear God. Meaning, that seems like, that man is not just a sophisticated animal and then 10% fear of God or 20% fear of God. Man is entirely fear of God. Meaning, to the extent that you fear God, to that extent you're an Adam. To the extent you don't fear God, to that extent you're an animal. What does that mean? Very simply. A lion. Could you put a lion in like, um, in a little metal fence? No, we'll just bash it down. You need iron chains to, to shackle a lion. You know, what do you need to hold down a snake? How are you going to keep a snake... Uh, how are you going to keep a, keep a, vis- a vicious snake I- I- intact? How are you going to keep it from causing damage? You need to put, put up glass, like four inches thick, and uh, keep the snake inside. What are you going to do to keep a gorilla in check? You need big bars that you can't even, but you can't even cut with a, uh, you know, any kind of machine. But a human being is a lion, and is a tiger, and is a snake, and is a cobra, and is every vicious animal in the world. So what kind of bars and shackles and chains do we need? Because we have a lot of stuff going inside of ourselves that could be very vicious and very powerful. What are our chains? What are our shackles? The answer is, there's only one thing that keeps man in check. Fear of God. Without fear of God... Man is the most destructive force in the universe. To the extent that a human being fears God, he's a human being. To the extent that he doesn't fear God, he's an animal. You know, the Gemara talks about that you're not allowed to travel by yourself with an Amah Aretz, the Gemara even says. Because the Gemara says that someone who doesn't fear God is literally dangerous. Would you travel by yourself, not with the ranger in the forest, with a lion in the forest? You know, the lion not going to do it. Rabbi, it's nice of you to come to Markola Lodge. You want to go for a little spazir in the forest tonight? Just me and you. You know, how about that? You're not coming back, right? So, 
if some if somebody does not have Yerushalayim, they're a menace to society, a menace to the world. The says Rabbi Hanan, this is what it means in in Kahelas. Kizeh kol ha'adam. Without Yerushalayim, you're not an Adam. You're a collection of every behema chayav oif in the world. Now it's a frightening concept, and we could say when I, once when I gave this share, so a friend of mine said. The Pasuk says, Vayyamalikim, Nase Adam, God says, Let us make my man, Bitsalmenu in our image, Kidmusenu, Vyirdu and he should dominate, Vidigas Hayam, the fish, Uva Ifa Shamayim and the birds, Uva Bahima and the animals, of Khalaras. So literally that means man controls creation. Man will dominate everything in creation. Man will be able to create the the know how and the technology. To dominate the world, we be, which we have, right? We've captured every animal in the world. We have control over all of creation. But on a deeper level, you know what the Pasuk is saying? God says, let us make man. God is talking to all the animals. And the bird kingdom and the, and the fish. And God is saying, let's make man. And then man, do he needs to dominate the fish inside of him. That's his job. His job is to harness and to shackle and to put in check all of the various forces and powers of creation that lay dormant inside of him and control them and keep them in check. And the way we keep it in check is with fear of God. It says with David Kronglass, the Mishnah in Pir- Pirkei is giving us a very important message. When you're lying there in bed and you feel like there is no way that you could get up, you have to realize, you know, there's a lion inside of you. And that means you have the latent power of the Ari to literally overcome any obstacle and every, any sluggishness and any tiredness. At first glance, it seems uh, very perplexing. You're telling me to be like a lion? Yeah, you know why we could tell you to be like the lion? Because you have the force, the power of the lion inside of you. Now you have to be very careful. You don't want to use that force to trample your friend, to step on your friend, to destroy someone, to harm someone. But you could harness that power to overcome atzlos. You could utilize your boldness of a, a leopard. Don't use it for the wrong reasons. If you don't have your shamayim, a person could use chutzpah in an improper way, in, 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 in a wrong way. But if you harness the power of the leopard inside of you, then you're able to accomplish tremendous achievements. It's a very compelling message. It's a message that should resonate within us. The Rebbe Hashem is saying, you know, sometimes a person feels... Yeah, you know, what am I going to be in life? Do I, am I talented? Do I have capacity? Do I have ability? Do I have ability? Every human being has been programmed with such infinite ability. The power, the might, the agility, the creativity, the ambition, the boldness, all of these forces are laid dormant within ourselves. A, a, a person can never say, I can't, I'm not able to, that's for somebody else. Every human being, every human being has been endowed with, it says in Mishle, Mayim Amukim Chachma Belevish. There are deep, deep waters in your heart. Now, it's all a matter of summoning it forth. It's all a matter of pulling it out. But the ability, the creativity, the boldness, the passion, the desire, it's all inside. It's a matter of unleashing it. It's a matter of unleashing it. You know, you look at you, What's going to be with my little kid? What's going to be with my kid? Is he really going to be something one day? Does he have it within him? I don't know what's going to be with this kid. Is, does, has Hashem given him, the, given him the ability, the talent, the force, the creativity to make it in this world? Huh. God gave it to him. You're the parent. You have to bring it out. But don't, don't get down on them. They have what it takes. They have more than what it takes. If you would only appreciate even a small amount of the ability that every single human being has been endowed with. The Rebbe Hashem is telling, uh, telling us, you're greater than a lion. You have the power of the lion, you have the agility of the eagle, and you have the swiftness of the deer. You have it all within you. It's a matter of unleashing it. It's interesting, by the generation of uh, the Mabal, so God says to, uh, you're hot. Torah makes you hot, right? That's... that's it, it literally uh, raises room temperature over here, right? So, by the generation of the flood, it says that Hashem says, Kate's kabas are balafanai. That's it! I'm going to destroy man. Why? Ki malar, um, 
Because all the animals are corrupt. So God says, I'm going to destroy man because the animals are corrupt. <laughs> God, if you want to destroy man because man is corrupt, so destroy them. If you don't want to destroy man, don't destroy man. Why is God saying, I'm going to destroy man because the animals are corrupt? It's also interesting. In Kriya Shema, what do we say every single day? So we say in Shema, Hashem says, V'charaf Hashem b'chem, I'm going to get angry at you. V'yatsar es I'm going to withhold the heavens. V'lo yiyamater v'avarat ha I will destroy you immediately, quickly. So Rashi asks, why is God going to destroy us quickly? He gave the generation of the flood 120 years. So why can't He give us 120 years? So Rashi says, no, no. The generation of the flood had nobody from whom to learn from. But we have from whom to learn. So the simple meaning of that is, we have the Torah to learn from. So God has no patience with us. Either we get the message, or that's it. But the generation of the flood, they didn't have the Torah. So since they didn't have the Torah, Hashem was more patient with them. So Rev. Ezreal Hildersheimer says, no, there's something much deeper here. You see, we don't just have the Torah. You know who we have to learn from? We have the animals to learn from. Uh, the job in life, one of the jobs in life, is to recognize the ability and personality and character of every item of creation. To study every bird and every fish and every animal, figure out what their greatness is, what their ability is, and see how we can learn from them. You see, in a way, man is the greatest of all creation. Man is the the pinnacle of creation. Man has Seichel, man has Das, man has Dibur. But on the other hand, man is the lowest of all creation. Why? Because man was created from them. So it's our job now to look at everything in creation, recognize what their power and ability is, and learn from them. So we now have to become students of the sun, students of the moon. What, what should we learn from the sun and the moon? Consistency. Consistency. But I davened yesterday. I came early yesterday. Again, I have to come early? Every day. Rise, rise and shine. Rise and shine. Consistently. I could do that. I could come to show with the same enthusiasm, the same energy today as I did yesterday. No difference at all. Steady like the sun. Steady like... But what do I got to do with the sun? Realize the ability of the sun you have inside of you. When that alarm goes off, you say, I have that. I could do that. The sun goes up. I get up. Not learn from the sun. Realize you have the ability in this, of the sun within you. You have the ability to be consistent. That's what we learn from inanimate objects. From the inanimate objects, we learn the, the ability, the, great, um, the, the greatness of consistency. What do we learn from the plants? So the Medrash says there is no blade of grass that doesn't have an angel standing over it, saying, what? Gadel! Gadel! Grow! Grow! Grow, grow. So in America, we have the gardener come every week. You know, it's such a waste of money. Why does it have to come every week? Like, you know, come once a year. Problem is, the grass grows every week. You know, if you don't cr- cut it one week, by the time the next week comes, it's going to be up. The plants are always growing. They're not like animals, uh, you know, or humans. We, we cap at it at a certain height, and that's it. No. The plants, they just keep on going higher, 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 higher. Because they have that angel saying, Gadel, Gadel, Gadel. The Medrash says on the Pasuk, Yaroif Kamata Likhi, Tizal Katal Emrasi, that the Torah is like the rain on a plant. That the same way rain makes a plant grow, the Torah makes those who learn it grow. That means someone who's involved in learning is a different person today than they were yesterday. What we learn from plant is never to be satisfied with the way we were yesterday. Oh, I already came a long way in life. So now, are you ready to go up to Shemayim? You ready to you know, dig a hole and bury yourself? Every day, we don't care about what we've accomplished in the past. Every day, we, have, we should have a desire, a yearning, a passion to grow. Grow? Oh, come on, that's for kids. No, you're a blade of grass. You have it within you. You have that ability latent within you to be able to grow at a rapid pace. Now, not, don't jump more than, you know, don't bite off more than you could chew. You know, even a blade of grass, you don't necessarily recognize the growth of the blade of grass after one day. But it did grow. So in Judaism also, you don't have to make 
wholesale changes every single little bit, a little tiny bit, minuscule amount, but every day to push yourself to try to climb higher and higher and higher. That's the lesson of the, uh, tso, tso, the, the level of tsoimeach, of those items that grow. And then we come to the ant. And the ant teaches us a very powerful lesson. The Do- David Krongrass asks, okay, so the ant, all it needs to eat for its entire existence is one kernel and a half of grain. And yet it gathers and it gathers and it gathers and it gathers. Why, says the Medrash, Maybe God will give me life. And if God gives me life, what am I going to eat? So if maybe I'm going to live, so I need food. It's like when you go on a trip. When Jews go on a trip, it's amazing how much we pack. Right? We're going for two days. We had 90 suitcases. Right? Milchiks, fleshiks, parev, five kinds of shoes, Shabbos tzitzis, weekday tzitzis, Shabbos talis, weekday talis, 500 svarim. Why? You know, I might need it. That's how, that's how we think. Maybe I'm going to need it. And what's going to be, especially you know, when you go on an airplane, you ever see how people pack? I know, for some reason, when I go on an airplane, I have to think, but what if I need this? All of a sudden, you know, you're coming on the airplane, and looking, what do you breathe? Who do you have in there? But that's the, the, the argument of the ant. Maybe God will give me life. I don't want to be stuck in a situation where I don't have ample supplies. But ant, if you live longer, there's a harvest next year. You don't have to collect as if you're going to live for a billion years. Says of David Kronglass, God did not program the ant that way for the ant. The ant doesn't need to collect so much. He programmed the ant that way for us. Because when it comes to us, it's not maybe God will give us life. God will give us life. We have eternal life. We say, After the body has uh, finished its stay in this world, we live forever. The question is, are our suitcases packed with enough provisions for that long journey? And you look at the ant, and the ant says, I know I only need a kernel and a half now, but what am I going to eat in a thousand years from now? Ant, you're not going to live in a thousand years, you're not going to live for seven months, but maybe I will. But we will live in a thousand years from now, and we're going to live in a, in a million years from now. And we have, we have to learn from the ant to gather in this world as much provisions as possible to take in our suitcase with us to have what to benefit from in the next world. And we, know, we all know what that is. Torah Mitzvah. It's the only currency that they take. They don't take the rand upstairs. Right? They don't even take the rand in America, so they certainly don't take it upstairs. So the lesson of the, of the ant is what's going to be if I live longer than this world? I'm going to need food. I'm going to need to pack suitcases. That's a very important lesson. The lesson of gather, 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 gather as much as we possibly can so that we're not in a situation where what am I going to eat tomorrow? That's the lesson of the ant. And the truth is that this is a very empowering concept. The fact that we have tremendous ability within us I think we underestimate our, oh, I can't learn anymore, I just, I, I, I just don't have the strength. Maybe we do. Maybe we do have the strength. Not maybe, we do. Now the question is, how do we access it? And what we have to become are students of the animals and students of the entirety of creation because they're our creators. They chipped in. They all threw their hat on the table. They all gave a little donation and they made us. So we need to learn what is that donation. But never underestimate any person. Don't underestimate your children. Don't a- underestimate your family, your friends, any Jew, any human being, and certainly not yourself. The, what we could tap into is really endless greatness, endless ability. And, but on the other hand, we have to keep it in check. You know, sometimes somebody says, you know, let's go here to do this Avera. No, you're a mule also. Be stubborn. You have to know when to be stubborn. You have to know when to pull out which card. When to be stubborn, when to give in. We have, God has given us a lot of cards in our pocket. You know, you have to know which card to pull out at which time. And if we're able to learn from everything uh, we've seen here on this uh, safari, and, uh, you know, great people, they don't have to go on the safari to... They learn from la- observing life around them. But if we have the good fortune to see these animals up close, it could give us opportunity to think and to focus 
what their greatness is, what their ability is, and utilize it and harness it for Avodah Hashem. So, the Perkei Avay says, Havi az ka nomer, the nomer within you, Havi kal ka nesher. God says you could be consistent like the sun and the moon in you. And uh, I think this is an idea that could really empower us and uh, help us achieve greatness in life and in especially Avodah Hashem. Thank you so much. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.